Welcome. My name is Mick. I work at Firestorm Books and Coffee, and I'm here to kick us off for this super exciting event we have tonight where we have an amazing cast of panelists who will be taking time to discuss the nuances of parenting and educating in this time of global pandemic and political turmoil. So first, for an event that centers parenting and education in response to some of the most pressing issues facing us today, we feel it is important to acknowledge the political context of the land we are on and that wherever we are viewing or speaking from in the United States, we are on indigenous land. For our context at Firestorm, we are on occupied Cherokee territory in Southern Appalachia and so-called Asheville, North Carolina. As it is our responsibility to critically engage with this colonial legacy, tonight's event will attempt to grapple with some of the present day implications of its ongoing impact. For folks who don't know, um, Firestorm is a collectively owned radical bookstore and community event space. With a focus on queer, feminist, and anarchist thought and culture, we host a wide range of events, workshops, film screenings, and discussions, as well as meetings for various grassroots community organizations. Since the, since the shutdown was first put into place back in March, however, our doors have been closed to the public, but we continue to sell books online through our website and ship all over the country. We also have had success in converting some of our community programming to online and virtual events like the one you are attending tonight. And these kinds of community events are made possible through our community sustainers program on Patreon, where a small monthly contribution helps support us to continue putting resources toward creating content like the kind you are watching here. Tonight's event was also organized in collaboration with our friends at PM Press. PM Press is an independent radical publisher of books and media intended to educate, entertain, and inspire. Founded in 2007, PM Press amplifies the voices of radical authors, artists, and activists. Their aim is to deliver bold political ideas and vital stories to all walks of life. Tonight's event is the first in what will hopefully be a series of events in collaboration with PM Press, the next of which you can catch on Thursday, November 19th, which will be a conversation of community self-defense with anarchist writers Scott Crow and Kim Kelly. So thanks again to PM Press, uh, especially Stephen, if you're out there watching, <laughs> for helping to organize tonight's discussion. Um, like I said earlier, tonight's conversation features a panel of activists, educators, and, pan and parents who will discuss lessons, challenges, and strategies of parenting and educating during a global pandemic, uprisings for racial justice, the rise of fascism, and more. Panelists include Maya Williams, China Martins, Michelle Cruz Gonzalez, and Akila S. Richards, uh, who will have further introductions later. All of the speaker's books, um, all of the speaker's featured books can be purchased online directly from our website, which is firestorm.coop, that's firestorm.coop, and shipped anywhere in the United States uh, with the added bonus of $1 shipping for any in-stock titles. And uh, we are very lucky to have a featured moderator for tonight's conversation. John Mink is a social studies teacher who works at the high school and adult school levels and refuses to hide his political radicalism from his students. He has been a contributing writer and editor for underground publications and zines, including Slingshot, Absolutely Zippo, and Collapse Board editor of the Maximum Rock and Roll Monthly column, Teaching Resistance, and a vocalist and bassist for several internationally recognized punk bands. John lives in Berkeley, California with his partner, Megan March, who is also his bandmate, 
and their feisty, adorable toddler, Julian. John, thanks so much for being here tonight, and I'll pass it over to you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming, and many thanks to Firestorm and PM Press for facilitating this event. This is a really exceptional night, and I really appreciate you being here. We all do. Uh, my name, as is mentioned, as Mick mentioned, my name is John Mink. Uh, I edited an anthology of radical educator perspectives called Teaching Resistance that came out on PM Press last year. Uh, one of the contributors is uh, Michelle Cruz Gonzalez right there on the panel. Um, would be an excellent 924 Gilman backdrop. Um, so I'm a public high school history teacher and I'm currently trying to figure out the best way to effectively teach about the Haitian Revolution on Zoom next week and facilitate good conversations this week about uh, Ava DuVernay and uh, Michelle Alexander's work. So it's been a pretty inspiring and interesting time as students kind of cope with this new reality and try to come up with ways to find real connections and community online. Um, I'm also a co-parent to a 16 month old and these are both pretty challenging and energizing roles in this complex and difficult time we're living through. And neither of them would be even remotely possible without a lot of active listening to the beautiful people in my life who I'm in this wild boat with, including my partner, Megan, baby Julie, and my students and other teachers. I'm grateful to be here tonight in the presence of the brilliant minds and powerful ideas on this panel. I look forward to immensely to hearing their vital perspectives on understanding and navigating the waters of this very unsettled world that we all share. Uh, as activists engage in collective struggle to secure justice and healing from centuries of, colonial, centuries of colonialist oppression and gendered violence, we recognize that some of the most crucial current battlefields that we are seeing are in the struggle for educational equity and the meaning of family. Uh, these are topics that are rife with systemic roadblocks and a deep, deep aching for transformative, positive growth and true radical change. So the panelists tonight are Maya Williams, China Martins, Michelle Cruz Gonzalez, and Akila S. Richard. And I'll introduce the panelists and then we'll begin the discussion. Uh, Maya Williams is a writer, a visual artist, and birth worker, and has lived in, uh, worked and lived in Mexico, Palestine, East Africa, Egypt, Germany, Ecuador, and the United States. She is the author of two books of poetry, No God But Ghosts and Monsters and Other Silent Creatures. She is co-editor of Revolutionary Mothering, Love on the Front Lines, and author of This is How We Survive, Revolutionary Mothering War and Exile in the 21st Century. China Martins is a writer, glamazon, and empty nest, low-income, anti-racist, white, radical, single mother. She is author of The Future Generation, the zine book for subculture parents, kids, friends, and others, co-editor of Revolutionary Mothering, Love on the Front Lines, and co-editor of Don't Leave Your Friends Behind, Concrete Ways to Support Families in Social Justice Movements and Communities. Michelle Cruz Gonzalez, a Chicana educator and punk writer, Michelle Cruz Gonzalez is in, or is the, uh, the author of The Spitboy Rule, Tales of Chicana and a Female Punk Band. She has published in Long Reads, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and several anthologies, including Teaching Resistance, um, as I mentioned previously. Michelle teaches a variety of Englishes and creative writing at Las Positas College. And by the way, I love her bands and things. Uh, Akila S. Richards hosts Fair of the Free Child, a lifestyle and parenting podcast about the connection between liberation, learning, and parenting, particularly among BIPOC communities. Her voice and work have been featured on NPR, NBC TV, Good Morning America's blog, and in several print and web-based publications. The TEDx speaker, accomplished digital content writer, and sought after facilitator is part of a nomadic family of four. Her new book is Raising Free People, Unschooling is Liberation and Healing Work. So the questions tonight, we're gonna be having a discussion that's conducted in a conversational format with the panelists engaging with the questions as they feel inspired to do so and building on each other's perspectives. It is um, less formal than some, but I think that this is a really good group for this. If you have questions, please submit them to the Q&A field and we'll set aside some time to go through these questions toward the end. So beginning, and I, I love that this is how it's structured to begin actually, because this is how a lot of my classes begin too. How are we holding up, right? Let's take a look at some questions. How are we holding up? What are your personal challenges in this moment as parents and or educators? Who would love to jump in on that? 
Anybody want to jump in? I can do that. Um, yeah, so peace, everybody. Um, I am here on Muscogee Creek land, um, so-called Atlanta, Georgia, USA. Um, and as far as holding up, how I'm holding up, I was in a session earlier today where somebody said <laughs> their answer to this question was overwhelmed. Um, and I would say that's a lot of times that's where I am. A lot of times that's the correct answer. But what, what is a part of that is also a sense of um, an overwhelm that's not a bad one. It's like there's so much inquiry now around humanizing our intergenerational relationships that makes the overwhelm at times um, good for me. So that's that's today's answer. <laughs> Who else would like to jump in on this? How are you, how, what are your challenges? How are you, how are you feeling on what we're facing? Um, hi, hi everybody. Um, I like the, the answer overwhelmed. Um, I am currently, my daughter is 13 years old in eighth grade doing um, virtual learning from home, which is a definite change. Um, and that has, a, along with that, the past year has been, um, I live in Minnesota at the moment. Um, and as I'm sure y'all know, there was a pretty significant uprising that happened this summer um, uh, in Minneapolis, where I spend part of my time and part of my time out here in rural Minnesota. And so I think that one of the things that I've been grateful for is that by this time in my life, having been through uprisings and everything before, uh, the amount of changes that have occurred in the past, like let's say 10 months, like just the amount of, you know, the, the amount of uncertainty and changes both in my personal life and in the sort of larger political realm, global realm, um, is there's a skill in there and being able to sort of surf on top of it for most of it. And I think that, um, those of us who have not always been structurally privileged have that skill maybe in more, um, you know, just a little bit more um, experience than people who have been. And I've, in, in some ways, I've been exhausted. I'm exhausted, y'all. I'm exhausted. But in some ways, um, I've been really grateful being like, oh, okay, maybe having had to do those sort of struggles in the past made it so that this moment is way more accessible for me. Um, so yeah, I think that's how I'm doing. Yeah, I, I, I grew up in a really small town. It was really boring and there was like nothing to do. And in the winter it was like really cold and you just like stayed at home and sat in front of the wood stove. And that was like pretty boring, but like you read books and, or I read books and listened to records and um, did a lot of thinking and, and planning. And uh, that's kind of what I'm doing now. I mean, I'm really, I am really sick of being at home. I'm getting sick of it. I'm, I, as a, as a mom with um, a teenager at home, I am tired of people asking me what what's what do we have to eat is there any food like it's my job um those things are really kind of wearing on me i have to say um i have really good days um you know most of the time i'm fine but like that's my big i think being at home has both been good because we're safe and we've we've uh, made some changes around the house and taking better we're taking we're taking more advantage of the space we have we're appreciating the space we have more which i think is really has really been great, you know, moving things around and using our space better. Um, that's been a really great lesson, but geez, like just all these people on top of each other trying to share the bandwidth and stuff. It's pretty like, it's some rough days. <laughs> and I've been cutting my own hair, you know, so there's all that. Your hair looks really good though. Um, <laughs> How I'm doing, I kind of wanted to go last because I feel like I'm on the end of the, the opposite spectrum. Um, how, because I feel like I'm aging a lot. I feel very isolated. Um, 
I'm 54 years old and in, in my early zine, the future generation, I remember writing, is parenting all or nothing? Is it always like too much or too little, you know? And so I feel quite isolated right now and that's really not good on my mental health. Um, and I'm single and I live alone. The only person in my pod is a six year old who I nanny for and he comes to my house and that's actually great. Um, and our experiences with Zoom first grade are really good, which I feel is not the typical story. Um, my daughter is 32 and she lives in the neighborhood, like a neighborhood away from me with her husband. And I have not hugged her this whole time. And that's really intense, like a single mom and single kid, you know, she's an adult, she has her husband, they're in a pod, she takes it very seriously. Um, and she's out there in the workforce. I mean, also as a daughter from a single mom who's been working, you know, since she's 15, always, um, she was in the wedding industry and there was, she was in a lot of situations that was very uncomfortable that she didn't feel comfortable with and she doesn't want to expose me to things. Um, and then, and then she switched careers and she got to be, um, she's in construction, um, coordinating jobs and it's better, but again, she doesn't feel comfortable with what she has to do out in the work world. And so we haven't gotten to a point yet that we are like physically close. She calls, you know, we take social distance walks and everything like that. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I think um, that's intense and just, um, so the age thing, I feel like I might not be sharp this evening because I'm a morning person also, but <laughs> so yeah, that's where I'm at right now. It's a, uh... It's really important to check in and see where we're at with these kinds of things, right? Because everybody's going through some journey in this of their own. In terms of Skillshare and just thinking about how we can build on ideas and just everybody kind of trying to, it being such an isolating world, right? And thinking about how we can help each other out. What are some practices? I mean, we've talked a little bit on this. Some of these were touched on in, in your responses, right? But what are some practices that we can think of that you've developed as parents and as educators uh, that help to sustain you during this time of pandemic and political turmoil, all these things happening in the world. What are some practices? I'll start with that one. Um, first of all, you know, as educators, this has been pretty hard for me as an educator because, um, you know, aside from having to learn how to teach online completely, which I've never done before, um, the teachers, you know, when you're in education, you are like a peddler of hope <laughs> because, you know, we're always, you know, talking about the future and what getting an education can get you. And um, when your job in the world is to be a cheerleader for young people and be a peddler of hope, <laughs> in this time, it has been so hard. Like, I have, I think my main strategy has just been to um, not be a downer, but to just be really honest with my students and to, um, I did write them a letter before the semester started that talked about how scary what, what we're experiencing is, but that I had lived through, um, you know, the, 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 um, the arms race and Ronald Reagan and um, the growing up feeling like we were going to be annihilated by nuclear war and like really feeling that in a very visceral way. And I told them, you know, like I didn't think that I would get, I really thought that would happen. And I didn't really think that we would be here when I was this age. So I've lived through that. And so I tried to use that to like cheer, cheer them up and cheer myself up. But, um, you know, there, you know, when things have gotten really, there have been some really bad, hard days. And um, I guess my main strategy has just been to try to find a balance. I'm not going to be rosy, you know, with the complete rosy cheerleader. I mean, we just have to be honest with our students. Um, they, you know, like right away, they wanted to know, are we going to go back to school, you know, face to face in the spring? And I was like, probably not. We're probably not, I'm not gonna lie. That's what we've been told. Um, so 
I guess that's really, really the main thing. Like, you know, being a peddler of hope is very difficult um, in, the, in these times. And, um, you know, when we had the, fi the, the fires and we had a day in the Bay Area, John probably remembers this, where it was dark. It was like dark all day. The sky was orange and dark because there was so much smoke and particulates in the air. And I had to teach that day online face to face, you know, on Zoom. And st we were all really wigged out. It was very hard to not feel like this was the end of the world. <laughs> I've never, I've never been in a teaching situation like that before. So that's been hard. That's been hard for sure. But, you know, honesty is good. And also, you know, you just kind of try to find that balance. I don't know. It's none of it's magic. Anyways. Some other perspectives on uh, practices, specific practices, things that are helping you get through. Um, it's been interesting because I absolutely identify as an introvert <laughs> um, and own that like a comfort blanket. But right now, one of the things that's been really helpful is being in deliberate community, you know, like it's always been deliberate or for a long time, but like eye to eye and doing real time things and things that usually for me are what I don't want to do. Um, because, but I'm doing it because I find that it's useful to, to feel useful, <laughs> you know, and to be in a space where you can be having conversations where because of all of this unraveling, we're not it's a lot harder for people to come through with like the person with the answers or to expect somebody to have the answers. So there's a different quality of togethering um, that's been really um, helpful and, and helps me to get through because it, it, is, it is a hope thing in that, oh, okay, here's another sign that we are starting to recognize that who we actually are and how we actually feel, like the way we did a check-in when we started, is is relevant it is its own conversation it, it is its own course of study and i feel it's been helping me a lot to see that happening and to participate in that and to invite that sometimes too yeah. um i have so many strategies <laughs> For taking care of myself um, and for um, being a nanny to a six-year-old of what I'm going through right now and um, yeah it's a I feel like it's um, learning how to move into this next stage where I became a parent at 21 so the first half of my life my daughter helped ground me so actually I think it's kind of amazing to really be looking after myself and um, Oh, yeah. Like, okay, so I'll just say some of the strategies. Um, well, I garden a little bit in the backyard. It's like, but just, it's very small. It's like flowers and herbs, you know, but it's like, I just have to watch myself because there's nobody else here to watch me if I fall apart, you know? And um, I do a lot of strange things sometimes. Like right now I've been signing up for a lot of self-help online stuff. Uh, like a church on Facebook had a mental health counselor that was going to talk about stuff like once a week and they've been like amazing and I'll even sign up for weird things like apartment therapy that I get these emails and in the beginning of the pandemic I was really getting deep into modern dance okay I've never done dance before also the six-year-old me and him we are doing dance prompts every day and so it's like, it's connecting, it's, it's connecting in a physical way to a greater community because there's all these like amazing dancers in Baltimore and they're sending out prompts. And I was watching videos of them dancing around the city. So, you know, the, the prompt of the day, you have to act it out. So we're in the park doing this thing, recording it. Um, once there was a time I was in a painting class. It's not like, it's not like every day it's like club med around here. These are always like changing. I just have like these little strategies to like, so I know what day it is, you know, just to like keep going in this, like giving myself more structure. And um, with my, the kid, I used to like take the bus, 
pick them up from school, we'd walk all around the city. Well, now as a person who doesn't have a car and I, I'm not riding the bus, everything's around here. We've developed all different routines. Like I'm really glad that I'm next to a park. I'm really glad I have a little backyard, you know, but we've just developed like lots of routines and like cool things that we do together or even when the sun goes down, trying to catch that golden hour, you know, and like read a chapter then. He has lots of graphic novels he brings over. I mean, he is, he's, he's basically the funnest person. If you're gonna have one person in your life, I actually have like the most amazing, nicest, funnest person. So, um, so yeah, so like I'm all, as an older person living by myself, I feel like I'm all about tiny little strategies to keep me going. These are some really good, um, really good ideas. And it's, it's good to have this kind of stuff come out so people can get ideas themselves because there's so many, there's so much need for people to be able to actually think about how they can cope in the world right now, right? Um, tied into that, is there anybody in terms of relationships, and there's some talk about this already in there, right? That, that's really relevant to it, but finding ways to stay in relationships with people in your life while practicing social distancing, right? How we're able to do that Again, so much of this is about family, and you've already kind of, all of you have described to some extent some of the relationships and how complicated they can get. So how are the connections maintained? What, is the, what are the positive ways and constructive ways that we can maintain connections with those we love and in our communities and in our families? Um. I'm friends with people I work with a lot. And so we're working on some, um, I'm working on some curriculum that is, um, it's actually lessons around um, linguistic justice, linguistic justice lessons, English lessons for college English classrooms. And uh, two of my colleagues are really good friends of mine. And um, we have been working on those together and that feels more, pressing and with an urgent um, after um, all the murders for, over the summer, um, starting with George Floyd and, you know, even before that, but, you know, after all the unrest, during the unrest um, in the summer, even though I was off, um, I really picked up my um, desire to, to write as many of these lessons as quickly as I could and to, um, to get them ready for teaching and turn them into um, units on on canvas and um, working with my colleagues who I'm working on them with we have zoom dates and we have like social distance walks or sitting on the porch and working on them together so it it's like for me it's been like because everything is so heavy I don't really feel I'm, I'm a little hard on myself this way anyways, but I don't really feel like I should rest. So, um, so um, we have been like socially working on these lessons, which is, and making time for it to be fun, but also working and like really feeling like we're doing really good, important work that's gonna make an impact like tomorrow in our classroom. Um, and actually the work is taking off and there really is a movement in the community college um, system and we've been giving talks on Zoom to different community college English um, departments. So that's been really fun to plan for. So, you know, just doing something where you really feel like you can make a difference right away with your friends. Yeah, to, um, I mean, to piggyback off of that, uh, my, my job, my, I guess my official job is I'm co-director of a community health uh, nonprofit in Minneapolis. And um, I mainly do the communications um, portion of it. But one of the things that we did um, in uh, the, we start, we basically took over a building that had been, took it over. We were offered it. Um, it, it was mutual. Um, a building that was about three blocks away. It's about three or four blocks away from where the third precinct was burnt down. Um, so in the neighborhood of Longfellow. And we took it and we, um, which was a great, day um but um anyways um we took it and we opened and we created like a community healing center inside of the 
uh, the, the coffee shop and the sort of art shop that had closed down, they offered it to us. And so we had a community pantry that ran twice a week um, and as well as sort of making uh, healing packages um, for, you know, so all of these sort of mutual aid projects we created um, in that space so that in part so that the because it was necessary and we had donations coming in and we wanted to find a good way to use them in part because there was i mean that burning, i mean the burning down of the precinct and and the three or four blocks around it frankly um meant turned the i don't know why i can't speak today but turned the neighborhood basically into a food desert um that's just that and so finding a way to um to make to get the community to feel like they were involved in the uprising the resistance in a way that was positive rather than just simply being do you know what i'm saying rather than being something that took away from them and the community is amazing it's a beautiful lovely community um and so we've been we did that starting in like late may and it just we just are closed it down this month We've also been doing, we, since we received a lot of donations just during that time, we've been doing drops of like $10,000 a month, where if you are a QT BIPOC or a BIPOC single parent or, or single caregiver, so um, you can apply for up to $500 um, and first come, first serve. And um, I, re I really enjoyed that project and it's incredibly heartbreaking. Um, because, like, for instance, last month we opened and closed that Google form in three minutes and $10,000 was gone. Um, and every month it just gets short, you know, like every month the need just gets greater and greater and greater. And the pantry was serving between like 60 to 70 families twice a week. And it's like a drop in the bucket, like, <laughs> clearly. Um, so in some ways that helps me to get a sense of like what the needs are in the community, what the needs are in Minneapolis, what the needs are, especially among like QT BIPOC folk and like parents. Um, and also makes it really clear how much needs to be done, how many people are living um, on the edge. They're, they're living on the edge. Um, so, I mean, that's, so that, in those ways, I feel really connected to the communities I work with. Like, I feel like I can do something that's beneficial and useful. And also, it's also really, yeah, it, 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 sorrow and joy kind of come hand in hand, I feel like, in community work like that and mutual aid work. Um, but one of the things I wanted to say as well is that I was really grateful to be able to, my, like I said, my daughter's 13. And I was really grateful to be able to like bring her through that process and to see once again, um, like what organizing and activism and movement work looks like. Um, and to see how, you know, for instance, we try really hard to take care of each other while we're doing this work. We obviously do, you know, a lot of social distancing and PPE and like cleaning everything a lot to be able, you know, to find that balance. Um, I feel like those are values I've tried to bring out or, or to emphasize with her that is, yeah. So I feel like this is also a time in which I get to emphasize those kinds of values with her. Um, so, yeah. I love that. And I love the way that you um, talked about emphasizing the values because that's one of the things that I am really appreciating in being in communities, you know, in various ways is seeing how that happens, like how those values are translated and how across and among generations we can get it, you know, not, not be told it, not be, you know, try to be convinced of it, but to really live it and see it in a way that influences and informs like, you know, the way we are together. And I, I really appreciate knowing the different ways that that's happening, like in your life in Minneapolis, I feel like it's a similar thing among a lot of unschooling communities that we tend to feel very isolated because the decision to do it often is not just about education or even if it starts out that way, 
family members, you know, some people kind of liken it to when people become vegan and people are just like, how are you going to, you know, and all of a sudden they're like super nutritionist critical. It's a, like times a bazillion with unschooling where people are just like, and then we are Caribbean people as well that have very specific ideas about how education happens and, and safety, you know, and what it means to move forward. And so to be in communities where the fact that we are doing this thing together and that we also do lots of other types of work together, it's really showing like how we can be useful. You know, I can see how I can amplify a thing because I have a podcast that is listened to in enough spaces that it's like, oh, I can take the responsibility of making sure that I know what sort of local mutual aid projects are happening in, in cities so that I can feel like, okay, some days I feel overwhelmed there's, and there's nothing that I can do. And other days, uh, a thing that also is a drop in the bucket <laughs> is also useful. And both of those things matter like at the same time. <laughs> Akila, let's, let's go a little deeper actually into unschooling and talking about it as a, a, a practice of deeper decolonization work, right? So we're thinking about how it's often described as such and um, maybe uh, let's break down a little bit what it does look like, like actually, I mean, you've described a little bit of some of the impact of it and some reactions, but let's talk about what unschooling actually looks like in practice, uh, particularly related to generational healing of trauma and uh, anti-racist education. How does it look? Yeah, it, um, so of course it will look very different for different individuals, different families, different groups. But essentially, I can speak to what, what it causes <laughs> more so than what it looks because that's just vast and varied. But oftentimes it, it starts out as an education thing, whether it's I don't want to be part of that particular system or we were in it just fine, but it didn't work out for my kids or a lot of uh, teachers who just were so heartbroken by what they couldn't get to do inside the confines of schooling, uh, you know, all these different things. So it starts out being like school centric or based on a school gaze, but then as you step out of that particular mindset and even some of the practices, then what it does is it, it offers you the chance to see all of the ways that the same way that school made a lot of decisions for you. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's not, you know, there's boundaries, there's consent, there's, there's a lot of nuance in it. However, you find that there's a lot of opportunity for you to step away from what you've just been doing, because that's the waters that you swim in, and start to recognize which things might not be okay for someone else, for you, because you have a different type of bandwidth to notice. And then that just starts to show you the, the, the intersections of how like one particular type of thing that feels oppressive here, you might feel it completely, but you might actually be the carrier of that same sort of oppression in another place. But when you're inside of a touch, go do this at this time system, it's really easy to miss that. And so oftentimes when you make a decision to, to not make school central, which is what unschooling is, it's not inherently anti-schooling, it's just like school isn't the central place where learning happens, then you start to recognize, oh, also yelling is not the central place where communication happens. Also, Pretending this way when my parents come over is not the way that like my nervous system get, getting better happens. And, you know, so it just kind of connects you to all these other ways that you were applying the same idea of like, well, if I do this at this time, this should happen. What's going on? It just shows that to you in a very broad <laughs> and continual way um, that then allows you to look at the ways that you have been colonized and that you also tend to colonize. So, and of course, in a lot of the communities that, that I identify with and part of as someone who moved to the U.S., you know, from somewhere else and the idea of the American dream and the idea of how I needed to show up or sound or look and it breaks all of those things open. And so we are finding that it is a liberation work because it is a, a 
a recovery, a reclamation, as much as a, um, a recognition and then seeing how you can be and allow very differently than what you'd been doing when you were just nine o'clock to 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, you know? <laughs> Can I, um, I, I'm so glad to hear that I home, I homeschooled, unschooled my kid. Um, what, um, I'm trying to think what the grades would be before she was eight years old. Basically, mm. what I'm trying to say <laughs> she started. Yeah. Cause she, she started, when we moved back to the state. She started in third grade and, um, I so agree with that. And I was thinking about the way, like one of the things that it taught me, one of the things that gave me a lot of faith in which I think had me have to rethink how I thought about a lot of society was how much her, she, it's okay. So in the normal idea around education, it's like she's like this blank slate and then you're, you know, you're filling in the slate, right? With, you know, that's what teaching is, is, is in the sort of classic enlightenment version of teaching, right? Mm -hmm. And um, realizing how full her brain, like realizing how full she was of knowledge, how full she was of like of understanding the world, of how watching her develop out her own stories and her own ideas was amazing and really actually just changed the way I thought about what human, how human beings are evolved. Like it made me think about so many other ways of thinking, you know, um, watching the way that she interacted with children because the, the children she was around didn't really go to school that much either. Um, cause we were, we were in Egypt on in Bedouin territory at that moment. And then we were in Ecuador and Quito. And, um, so, so being able to see that was sort of mind blowing for me, but it also, cause I just, but because, but it also made it so that when she entered into school in eighth, when she was eight years old, and we came back to the states, and I wanted her to, to understand. She was a U.S. citizen who'd never lived in the states, and I was like, okay, you need to have a little bit of time. Like, <laughs> like you need to become a little bit of a American enough that like you can understand what it is you do and which where you're supposed to have come from, right? So we brought her back to the states. Also, she, um, yeah, and. Uh, people were concerned if she would be, she was supposedly like a year behind in reading and da 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 because she'd been learning a, a second language every time. So she was still navigating it. One was how um, I realized I didn't really care about where she was in that process. That I had full faith that she'd get there when, when she'd learn what she needed to learn. She'd get out of it what she needed to get out of it. like. I kind of didn't care about grades. I didn't care about a standardized testing because I'd already seen what she was capable of. So when she went to school and her teachers, I mean, her teachers are lovely. They're absolutely lovely. It's a Montessori school. I did choose one that's relatively transitioned <laughs> between unschooling and uh, you know, classic yeah, public school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I felt, and I also realized, the last thing I'll say about it is I realized it made my relationship with her teachers much easier because I wasn't, while I wanted to make sure, you know, that she was happy and that she was getting what she needed to get out of it, I wasn't, I wasn't, cons I wasn't pushing for these sort of metrics to make sure that she was on point because I, I already knew her, you know, so I didn't have to wonder about it afterwards. So I just wanted to say, like, those are some of, like, and so now, but she's back home. And when she was back home in the spring, I was like, oh, we've done this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just do it again with you online sometimes. Um, yeah. 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 I appreciate that. Um, and I want to make sure, I see that uh, we lost our moderator, but I want to make sure that I'm not jumping in where anyone else was going to address something. Um, I do, I love that. And, and it's such a, it's an often heard story, like the way that we discover, cause I remember going through that too, cause my daughters are now 16 and 14. And when they were littles in, in elementary school, uh, when we first took them out of school after all this pushback from them for so long, I was so shocked by how little I knew about how learning actually happened because I just knew, because I mean, I was an excellent student, hello. So I knew how these things worked and it just was like, 
actually, <laughs> it wasn't that at all. I, I learned how much in the way my partner Chris and I were and how the idea of them being behind, that that was a context that I wasn't even okay with, let alone was one that I wanted to push for. And not only was I not okay with it for my children, that I wanted us, and when I say us for me, I mean Black folks in particular, to understand that there were ways that, the ways that we've had to navigate systemic racism, education in the conventional sense is, is one element. And now, in particular, there's such an opportunity for us to reclaim a learning that is not based on a particular gaze and it can include that but if we have this sort of knowledge of how learning actually happens and we've witnessed it and seen it and been like ow oh, so she's on the screen for like two weeks in a row and i'm about to lose my mind but then she said this one thing and i was like wait a minute we are trying to raise funds to get a person to do this particular thing for our organization and you learned it because like if we had that knowledge and practice I just feel like we could even utilize elements of schooling in ways that really could benefit people as opposed to the contortionism that we do for schooling at these costs that don't even pan out. <laughs> yeah. Hey folks, sorry about my disconnect there. I really, uh... I, well, I'm, I'm at my high school uh, that I work at, and this is part of one of the issues that we run into with remote education is uh, spotty Wi-Fi, not only from us, but also from students who oftentimes are stuck on a difficult side of the digital divide, right? So um, we get a taste of it from time to time as well. Um, so were people starting to were people talking about organization at all and things like that and things that are talking about collaboration or is there further further commentary on people what people want to talk about with regard to community and unschooling Did anybody else have any thoughts on that well yeah, I, oh, go ahead oh um i wanted to add a little um yeah i, I don't know why i feel like every time i'm i want to say something i feel like I'm adding something from a different place, but like, that's not true. So I don't know why I feel like that. It's like, I'm almost putting myself as like, oh, well, the old person's gonna talk now or something. Um, but but also just, um, I guess I just wanted to add of that, what it was like um, to be a single parent in the 90s in Baltimore, because when I had my daughter, I felt so strong about certain things. Um, I was an anarchist and I had community and I had friends and I was active and I just felt there was certain, I was like, I'm definitely going to have a home birth. You know, I'm definitely going to unschool her. Um, but the unschooling or schooling, that, that journey didn't work out for us, I felt, um, because my idea of homeschooling wasn't being home alone with her. It was like being in the world and that she would be learning all these different things. And I felt like the streets were incredibly unsafe. Only time I would ever see my friends was at bars um, and there wasn't many resources. And I felt very much pushed um, into putting her into school for, uh, to get support, to get any kind of support. And, um, and that's really why I started the other projects that I did later on in life, like don't leave your friends behind um, and that's why I continued into activism, even as my, especially as my daughter didn't need me. I wanted to work with community to build more support and more resources, because I do think there's so many different ways to learn. And I think you can learn in school and out of school and like, you know, the whole thing. I love how we're addressing the whole thing. But um, I just think it's that place sometimes where you can become very isolated and very, um, and very dependent on like how much money you have and what is your relation like just yeah i feel like single parenting can be a whole thing and um and then not everybody always has the same options for things i mean we all know that but just yeah i just wanted to add that that kind of uh 
um, I think sometimes people with ideals, they think things won't happen to them or, you know, or if something does happen, I don't, uh, now I'm just gonna be tired and rambling, but it was just, I just wanted to add like a small thing <laughs> about single parenting. And I know that, and I know I have single, I have marginalized single parent friends who successfully unschool. So I know that, you know, is possible. I'm just saying that you can be in places in your life where you're pushed into things um, that also go out in different ways that are fine too. I don't know. How do we, uh, what are some good ways that we can support single parents and other people facing other forms of identity based marginalization in terms of their schooling or unschooling? What are some ways that we can support them? so funny because I was the person who um, submitted that question and I don't have an answer. Um, and I was up in the middle of the night, like a couple of nights ago, I was writing my diary, this long, long thing, and I looked at it today and it doesn't make sense. And, <laughs> it's a good um, reason to ask a question. Yeah. And I was thinking about don't leave your friends behind with that, that conversation. It was like me and Victoria Law, who was like a younger radical mother, our discussions, and then talking with other people, sharing stories, expressing what you need, compiling lists. We did all kinds of work to help build support. But in this environment that we're right in right now, this kind of like isolation on top of that was already isolation, I'm a little bit like, I don't know, and I don't know how people are doing it. And that's why I'm really glad to be here in this conversation. This is my first like Zoom pandemic conversation. Um, yeah, so I actually don't know. I can if speak people... to that a little bit. Okay, yeah, and if people also, and if anybody knows like uh, the um, comments, I feel like anybody listening has ideas, I would love to hear comments on suggestions too on that to maybe compile for a list later. So one thing that I've been seeing quite often, there are quite a few unschoolers um, here in Atlanta and a little bit South Florida who started as a result of being, I only know single mothers in this particular instance who school was such a significant part of why it was difficult because in this particular instance, um, the example I'm thinking of is my friend Monique and she's been on my podcast quite a few times talking about it because we speak a lot to single parenthood and unschooling because it's actually oftentimes a place where, where some single mothers are finding the community they need so that the level of energy and attention that it has been taking for them to advocate for their children's needs in school and have to do it during the time that they're also at work. Um, now, as unschoolers, because we have unschooling schools, we have co-ops, we have all these different spaces, they now have other adults who are not confined to a system who can advocate for their children. So, for example, with Monique, her son was having so many issues with, uh, he has a few chronic illnesses, but he was always behind. And even his teachers who loved him and understood would be frustrated because his being behind also affected things that they needed to then explain and deal with. And coming out of that and going into what's called an agile learning center in this particular case, which is a type of unschooling school, a self-directed education school, um, he talked about how with all of the chronic illnesses that he had, it was leaving that environment that allowed him where he could cook for the bulk of the day, where he could go to work and know that he was safe, where one of us could drop him off because we had carpools and the time wasn't confined as it would be in school where you have to pick them up by this time or there's a fee and find daycare. So it really is often in, in a lot of instances, the togethering and the specificity of community support in unschooling environments allow for people who have a variety of different socioeconomic and you know other types of situations to be in community together you know so that we can lean on each other um, so that's some that those are some of the ways that i've seen it be really effective to just offer a different ecosystem for a single parent and a child particularly a child who doesn't you know fit inside of the the needs of school but um, can I ask you how they're doing under Corona though? Because that's, 
you know, maybe yeah. it wasn't like, specific enough. Yeah, because I don't understand, like, with all the social distancing, how that's affected. Yeah. And that's that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Like, like before we would get together and we could yeah. talk or, or, you know, you can suggest, you know, you can just do this little thing or spend a little time. But now that it's so serious about who you're allowed to see for how long, yeah. you know, like, do you have any input about? Um, yeah, the they're doing a lot of the things that we're doing, going online, you know, they're doing even things like gaming is such a sense of community for young people and also for some adults, you know, getting on Twitch and just like really going in. So they're doing a lot of the same things that we're doing, trying to figure out what does it mean to really like hold space together and stay on a call for a few minutes after they they're doing a lot of the things that we're doing because like us they can't get together in person so they're sorting through in in the same way like all the other humans <laughs> imperfectly but you know intentionally does anybody else have some elaborations on this some things that you'd like to add in this question. It's a really, really great series of answers. There's a lot of good stuff in the Q&A too. People are uh, putting in some really powerful stuff. We'll be getting to the Q&A uh, materials in a few in a little bit here. Um, anybody else have stuff that they wanted to add to that thread? Sometimes I think the question is how do you survive? Because I do agree that we will all learn no matter what, you know, we're all like, this is our learning experience. But yeah, I'm just concerned about people who are isolated. Yeah, it's an exceptionally difficult time. Well, what can, for those of us who are educators in here, which we all are to some extent, right? What can we do to collaborate with other parents and with other educators, both in these kind of remote networks and also in, you know, in as much in person as we can to promote themes of resistance and liberation that can tie into these ideas and that can help us to create new realities and think about what new realities can look like. Well, I do have a series of lessons that are um, public now because some of the, uh, the, one of the main goals of my, of my linguistic justice lessons is to make them accessible for anyone. Um, and so I put there on our college um, reading and writing site. So anyone who would like to use them um, in their unschooling schools or with their own young people can go to our website and um, use them and adapt them for their own age group and you know eventually I will write a book with theory and everything to go along with it but um, I didn't I wanted to make them you know in this sort of DIY way as accessible as possible for um, for everybody and I actually I have a link to a PDF with all the uh, with I have a uh, PDF with all the links that I could put somewhere but we don't have like a regular chat so I'm not quite sure where I would put that but um, I can I can share it, but um, the lessons are um, the focus is 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 quite an unschooling topic actually. It's um, it it's a series of lessons that are um, geared towards students of color, minoritized students, to help them write from their own positionalities and to choose topics that um, that draw from their lived experiences and to write from their different Englishes. And um, my department, our English department has come to a realization that, um, that there are all sorts of Englishes and like all linguists would say, not, none of those Englishes is better than the other. And um, it is time for colleges to, uh, for colleges and all, and all, all educational institutions to take up take up the, the, the cause and to actually recognize that students will be more engaged in their writing and in their assignments and they will know how to connect with other people and help themselves be better understood if they are 
allowed to write in whatever English or version of English they choose to write in. Um, so the, the we just gave it a name because, you know, in order to have to sell something or to, to promote something, you have to give it a cool name. So it's called Next Level English. Um, I'm going to put the link in our chat and then you guys can do whatever you want, but it's a link to a document um, that has links to all the assignments that we've created so far. And there's ones on positionalities. There's ones on using the personal pronoun I, how you can use that and how you should use it. It's called I belong in my essay. And um, there are several other lessons um, that are very specific. This is not theory. This is praxis. This is how this is a lessons for students on how to write from their positionality and how to include whatever version of English they want to in a quote unquote academic setting. So that's what I've been working on. And um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm proselytizing everywhere. So share the documents, use them, please. I'm going to be using that stuff. <laughs> Who has some more thoughts on this? Michelle, I love that, by the way. I absolutely, absolutely love that. I am a strong proponent of all different Englishes by far. I think it makes, um, for those of us who are writers, I also think it makes our writing much more rich than, but yeah, preaching to the choir on that one. Anyways, but right. It's yeah. like a no duh for people who yeah. are writers because <laughs> writers are celebrated all the time for, pushing the envelope and coming up with an interesting voice or developing their own style. Why can't we allow our students allow, and I hate that word allow, our students to do that. Why aren't we encouraging our students to do this? Like we're, we're, we're worried that they're gonna somehow get the wrong message or, or maybe we'll give them a sense of agency. <laughs> Yeah, I also think it's funny that you would go and get an MFA and they would be pushing you to write, you know, from the, from like the, the, the sense of like your own voice after you spent years not having one, then you spend another like $80,000 to get it back again. So I just love it. I absolutely love it. And nobody can figure out why. It feels like, well, but <laughs> how? Where did I get to practice though? That's the thing. <laughs> I'm going to quote you. That is so rich. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the other thing I was thinking about is that, um, like I said, my daughter's in this Montessori school, and I've had issues with the school. Um, they did some units a couple of years ago on like, we, we live on Lakota territory, and um, whatever, I, I won't go into it, but I was super happy at the same time to watch her teachers um, really grapple with the moment that's at hand, the political moment at hand, um, in a way that they were actually trying to engage the students. And I, I mean, it was sort of like a, sort of funny when you watch educators have a transformation for a second, you're like, oh, okay. In which they like, uh, for my daughter, she's in, eight, she's in eighth grade, they um, decided to study the civil rights movement and to relate it to these current times, obviously. That's the, but like some of the topics were things like the Black Panther Party and the move bombing and, you know, like things that I would be very surprised. I live in a conservative 97% white rural town in Minnesota, um, which is it's a lot of things, it's a lot of experiences, speaking of feeling isolated. Um, <laughs> yes, I, in rural Minnesota, we have chickens in the backyard. Um, so, but I was really, I felt really connected. I was so happy that her social world teacher decided to sort of take, to use this moment as an actual, like take the history and apply it to the present moment. Take a look at the movements that have been happening. Take a look at the trajectory that's been happening. Not, you know, there's a lot of mistakes that I feel like people have made about talking about the civil rights movement and the, fight for black liberation for middle school and high schoolers, the way that they present it, the way they present it is, you know, we can go into, uh, so the civil rights movement is Martin Luther King had a speech and then, ta-da, okay, then Barack Obama was president, I guess. I don't know how the full thing works, but like, it was really beautiful to see that happening. And I'll be honest, it was beautiful to see it in a, in a school that is 97% white and a lot of, um, you know, my daughter goes to school with people who voted, well, whose parents voted for Trump. Um, so I was really, I don't know, I felt like there was an insurgent moment in there 
watching um, teachers try to sort of bring it in both in the language arts class and in the social world class. And so once again, I'm, uh, yeah, um, and doing it over Zoom and trying to make it in a way that's actually engaging for a bunch of like 13 year olds who don't care about anything, supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> How's your daughter feeling about it? Has she given you any feedback about, you know, like the shift? Did she notice the shift in any of her teachers too in a certain I way? I think it's, I mean, I think that would be harder because she's not in class. Do you know what I'm saying? Like the students. And the other thing is, to be perfectly frank, um, my daughter's best friend, so I live in a small town. My daughter's best friend, Ellie, is the daughter of the social world teacher. And that's not uncommon here. So... You know, like everything's a little bit tighter um, about how you form mm -hmm. relationships and how you make community and how you network and how you do movement building. Um, so I just wanted to speak towards that because once again, I, I sometimes I'm very, imp I mean, the amount of work that it takes, I think, as an educator to be able to prepare those kinds of lessons and bring them forth and get the kids into it. Um, but what she did say, Teresa, uh, my father was a Black Panther. I just, in that for a second and so she took she chose the black panthers and was like and was super like into it she was really into it um and then i could send and then, then she could go the what do you call it the pantry where i was the community pantry that we were working the art studio put up the black panther uh t 10 i can i think of the word 10 point program mm -hmm. on the window um and so she could see like, okay, she has this, you know, she has this class that she's in and this project that she's doing. She happened to choose the Black Panthers and there's, there's a family moment to it, but there's also literally a, a modern contemporary moment where we hang out at as well. And, you know, so like yeah. doing that kind of work is, yeah. Uh, one of those ways, I guess, that like my unschooling method and then the school itself kind of came and worked together. To, yeah. Yes, which yeah. is very normal in unschooling because again, it's just, it's really about the place of each thing and the, the learner at the center, not necessarily, definitely mm -hmm. not doing a thing. Yeah, <laughs> love that. Seems like it's fundamentally uh, counter hierarchical, right? It's kind of like implicitly anti-fascist in terms yeah. of an education <laughs> approach. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in terms of, uh, I mean, these are obviously some opportunities that you're seeing in this context, right, for this kind of teaching. Um, in terms of like what you see as potential opportunities for us uh, and organizations, specific organizations and networks, right? So a lot of people are kind of asking about like, where do I go to get this kind of help? How can I connect to people of like mind to work together on this? Uh, what are some organizations and networks we can utilize for larger scale organizing that challenges the, the current system, right? So we have things like what Michelle's creating as a website for a repository for some of this radical educational material. What are some other networks we can take advantage of? I, oh, am I, I'm not muted. Um, it's okay, I jump in? Of course. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually have a lot on this list. And I made, I made this little zine. This is just for myself, like notes. This is like my hack. So if I'm reading from it, because I was trying to fill out and think. Um, one thing I'm kind of surprised about in a sense of just because like my background is more radical organizing and building your own things. Um, but as I seek help, you can look all around you and you can find things in all different ways. Um, I'm learning a lot about the Baltimore Teachers Union and I'm super inspired. And I think in this moment where everyone is talking about um, equity in forming your own little pods and how will that work, when I see all the organizings of the teachers union and how they're sticking up for the kids and how they're communicating and um, like there's protests, there's uh, Zoom meetings, they're talking about homeless children and children with disabilities and they really know the conditions of the school and um just like um yeah i mean i think it's been said before like i don't always think about unions but unions being like an anti abolition thing you know like um akila when you were talking like i feel like you have so much 
so much great things because it's like also it's the it's the unschooling collective you know like your your larger th thing so um just thinking that i feel like we have so many problems in baltimore and i think there's some new leadership in the teachers union too so it's just super exciting to see change in ways that i haven't seen before and um and then there also is the the radical child care collectives like my background of just going to like things that that you know calling back to things um, I used to be in a collective called Kid City that that did child care at radical events and it's in Baltimore and it's defunct now but one of the the members from that like Sina who lives in Oakland um, we did daily sing-along kids sing-along zooms in the beginning of the of the pandemic for like a month I was looking back because it felt like forever but no it was a month but it was like a half an hour daily sing-along with like guests like stars and people reading books and people from the Pratt library you know like everybody was floundering so I had so we we organized we had so many people um on there and so yeah I did that for a month before it was too much and people were going back to work and we started to change but there is one going on right now this one at Reed um in Albuquerque it's FAM free access to movement child care they still do a weekly radical kids programming Sunday at 5 p.m. every week, um, which would be open to any children. So again, that's BAM, free access to movement child care. And they're part of the radical child care collectives that support um, access for parents and children. Um, yeah, so those are my things I wanted to share. Um, and I think that there's a lot of groups like when you just start to look out there. I mean, there's like families belong together. Demanding families be united and ending family separation in central Ohio. There's motherful, which is by single mothers for single mothers. So um, anyway, Well, those are some resources. And hopefully we can get some of these uh, linked up to the um, to the post meeting stuff yeah for the recording excellent excellent list uh, some other thoughts on that in terms of specific resources or yeah I'll, I'll definitely make sure that I um, send a few things when I'm not on my phone for, right after this because there's one particular thing is uh, towards radical social change which is a gathering calling it an earthwide gathering uh, around um, unschooling and parallel education that's happening December 2nd through the 6th, virtually, of course. Um, it's co-organized by Zakia Ismail, who is an unschooling organizer uh, based in Johannesburg, and um, Kelly Limes-Taylor, who is, up until very recently, college professor here in Atlanta, um, and myself. And we're really excited about just this gathering of wherever people can get to something virtual, something digital, to talk about the struggles, the successes, and the, the different iterations of parallel education and community, particularly from um, a social justice-minded perspective. So that's happening December 2nd through the 6th, and hopefully it will continue. We're putting, we have it on the Mighty Networks platform, which is a sort of you know, place where people can gather that's not Facebook. Um, and we're hoping to really keep community and collaboration going on around um, sustaining and connecting folks um, who are doing not conventional education and parenting. So I'll be sure to put that, give that link after this. It's really powerful. Actually, one thing that's been tough, of course, in this pandemic and during the times of isolation being that the separation has made it so difficult for people to communicate within their own immediate communities, physical communities. But a silver lining to some of it, right, is exactly what Akila is talking about, which is that some of these networks can actually be opened up to a more global perspective. And you can meet with people who are like minded and have similar radical ideas and perspectives and real practice and praxis all over the world. And it, it, because we're all kind of acclimated now more to this, I mean, right now we're all meeting, we're in different corners of the world ourselves, right? And this is, this is something that maybe might not have been as normalized before. So there's, there are, you know, there's silver linings to all this extreme difficulty we're dealing with. 
Um, anybody else on that one? Anybody else have some thoughts on that one? I included a couple of links that could be put out to, on the public one. Um, there's one, so in, in the document that I created um, that went out earlier, there's a link to um, a document called um, Students' Right to Their Own Language, and that was actually created in 1974. It was a call for linguistic justice in 1974 that went largely ignored. And then um, over the summer, after the unrest, um, the three C's, the same organization, um, a group of, of professors, of black professors put out their own statement through the CC's called, this ain't another statement, it's a demand, and it's on black linguistic justice. And I posted that, that's amazing. You should read them both. And then um, you see, um, or San Diego State University has a really wonderful equity-minded um, president. Now he's the president, but, um, and faculty, and they put on this Black Minds Matter series of webinars, and their speakers are amazing. And um, they, they don't just talk about theory, they actually really get into practice and um, really specific teaching practices and information that could be used in, at, at all levels of education and unschooling too. There's some really fabulous resources also coming up in the, uh, in the Q&A, which are very appreciated. So uh, some really good stuff from Rebecca Kanu talking about uh, self-directed ed education communities, um, agile learning centers. So there's some links that we'll make sure to post up as well. Some really great stuff going on there. And also interestingly, as we're getting close to near the end of this, um, there's a question that somebody asked uh, that ties to one of the key questions that we had here, which is just a question of what does liberation uh, look like? You know, what, what, does, what does liberation look like? And how does that relate to parenting and or educating? And there's one person who asked about homeschooling pods, so things that can happen locally where people get together uh, that obviously are helpful in terms of people being able to, it, it has helped with, with smaller groups, right? You know, and this is a way that we're surviving. Um, so I guess the two things I wanted to bring up here before the end is that one person was asking about homeschooling pods, if anybody had any thoughts on that. And then also just what does liberation look like to you? What does liberation look like relating to parenting or educating in this context? Um, to the to homeschooling pods, I know that the Homeschool Association of California, which HSC dot org, maybe I don't know, um, but I know that they've been super duper active online and locally, um, I'm not based there, but I know a lot of folks there who are really just, again, just trying to get creative and connective around homeschooling pods, what to do, where there can be safe social distancing, where kids can get out, and um, also ways to, you know, kind of to what China was saying, ways to bring for folks who do have the digital access to bring or connect for people who don't have that or don't feel safe in those spaces. So I do know that um, HSC, that group, um, they're doing a lot of things online virtually through their newsletter and trying to do things locally to really help um, to create, you know, to help with the creativity around pods, around homeschooling pods and doing something outside of panicking around not doing what you're what you're used to doing yeah. um i wanted to I, i'm gonna i don't i'm gonna speak to the second question the parenting for liberation i think the liberation question because i wanted to i wanted to lift up a trina green brown's book parenting for liberation um i adore her uh, i adore the book just came out this year so you know citation is love um and um yeah, just speaking of resources, that's a great one in terms of her speaking really towards that question. So I'm gonna leave that in a larger way, but they'll speak for me personally. Um, and I, I, for me, you know, it was funny before, you know, when I, 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 I had a book come out last year. I think that was, it seems so long ago now, but at the time it seemed very important. <laughs> and like, um, 
and I would get asked a lot when I was going, I was on tour, I would get asked this question about like, well, what, like, don't you feel in some ways that you, like you're, I don't know how to put it, but sort of like, aren't you kind of contributing to the problem um, by like reproducing? I mean, I said nicer usually, but I think that's the crux of the, I mean, I'm fine with the, the question being asked in a, not, in a more blunt way um, in terms of not, not, not overpopulation so much, but this idea of bringing children into a world that's so, excuse my language, but fucked up. Um, and it certainly hasn't gotten better in the past year or two in the past, but uh, I said then, and I think I'll reiterate it now in terms of liberation, that, you know, when I, I worked in Palace, like I, I wanted to be a mother because of the work I did with uh, folks in Palestine and like indigenous folks um, in the Americas, especially in um, Chiapas. And one of the things that they were so clear about for me was that like, like our, this next generation and how we bring them up and how we raise them. And when we raise them inside of the struggle, it's so that the struggle will continue. And for me, that was really essential for how I saw my own, like where I saw myself inside of it. Um, Cause I think liberation, I think we want liberation to be like some sort of climax moment, but really it's a generational push towards something, you know, and I'm not, a, not someone who believes in my like, progress. I'm not, I'm not against progress, but I'm not, I'm not trying to give this progressive stance towards it, which is like every generation does a little bit better. Cause clearly, clearly y'all, <laughs> uh, it's a cycle. Um, but we, uh, we bring our children into the world. We educate children. We invest in the next generation um, in order that liberation is still possible. Um, and we do that in big and small ways. And that for me is just, it's not, I'm not saying that one has to do that. I'm just saying that it is an essential part of whatever liberation is gonna look like. So that's sort of my more philosophical view on it. Um, but uh, also again, Trina Green Brown, Parenting for Liberation. <laughs> Anybody there has just thoughts on what liberation looks like? That's such a big question. <laughs> it's so lofty. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I, I mean, the thing that comes to mind for me really is, is, is to really give up the ghost of the American dream. That truly is liberation. And um, that is a terrifying, just the idea that the American dream is not a thing, doesn't really exist, is dead, is really terrifying for a lot of people. If you talk to people about it, enough people about it, you will see that. And, and that, 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 that being the fact, given what we know about the, about the actual realities, about hierarchies and, and race and inequality in our country. Um, it's just so terrifying to people to think that, that, that it's not true. And when you can, when for me, getting to a place to, to really like, to really sink into that, that what, what it means that it doesn't exist has really freed me in a lot of ways. Um, in, in, it, in a way that's both terrifying and exhilarating so I don't know try it out if you haven't yet <laughs> I imagine most people here have already tried it out but that and also being able to speak whichever English you fucking want to <laughs> that yeah I'd also say maybe like what does liberation feel like you know because it's not always like words um even though liber liberation you know they always say it's in your mind too, but it's like, what would it be embodied? Because I think it is something that um, you can feel and you can feel like when psychology goes, everything's either like fear or trust, you know? I think in a liberated society, we would be able to trust ourselves more and trust each other more. 
that there is like enough, there's enough for all of us. And it's, um, but yeah, I think it's, um, cause a lot of times you think a definition of liberation, maybe it would be like all not being oppressed or not, you know, not all that stuff, but yeah, maybe it's something, I do think it's some, it, I do think it's a state that each of us kind of, kind of knows and can feel. But that's not very concrete answer either, sorry. Do we need concrete? Probably not, right? <laughs> I, don't think we, I don't think we do. We're just, we're, we're all climbing our, we're all clawing our way towards it, right? Slowly. Anybody else have any thoughts before we, uh, we're kind of at the, at the end of the scheduled time here. So does anybody else have anything, anything they want to add? I, I think it would be great if anybody hears this recording um, to keep sending, to keep sending tips just on that vein of like, don't leave your friends behind. Like I said, we used to gather up so many tips in person, having a conversation, because I think this is a great conversation. So I think, um, yeah, like I'm just, I'm up for like, keep um, compiling the concrete list of tips for now, for Corona you know, however small. Um, so yeah, I just want to say that. Absolutely. Well, great. It sounds, I think we're, we're pretty much at time here. Um, I wanted to take a moment before we go to, to thank our panelists. Uh, this was a really wide ranging discussion. Um, and we covered a lot of ground here. So thank you so much for all the thoughts that you brought here and resources that you, sh that you uh, shared with folks. Um, also really wanna thanks and appreciate John uh, for taking on that role of moderator. Uh, thank you for keeping the conversation flowing. It felt very organic and natural. Um, and thanks so much to everyone who attended. Um, both on our Zoom webinar and we were also streaming live on Facebook and there were some comments on Facebook as well. So if panelists wanted to take some time to check that out, there were some, co there were folks commenting and sharing thoughts there as well. Um, and yeah, that'll be, that, that'll be it for tonight. Um, thank you again, everyone, for showing up, for being here. Uh, attendees, uh, thank you for submitting your questions as well. It was a really lively conversation. Um, and I don't know, maybe we can get together and do it again sometime or something. <laughs> All right, folks. Goodbye. Good night. Peace, everybody. Thanks. This was nice. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks so much.